Great to be with you today. I got uh, Tina here by my side, and Dean Morris is with us again today. And we, most of all, believe that what you hear is going to inspire you and encourage you, and, and, and we always pray for you and believe with you. And so you have the information how you can contact me, and you notice the, the, the Grace Prayer Center, and you can email me, you can go to the website. And then I have that special little phone called my, my prayer phone. You can text me there. If you want to receive our magazine, for example, you can just text your address because it's free, so there's no exchange of finances. It's just something we offer because we believe it's a valuable ministry to people. And, uh, and so all that is there. Well, uh, and you'll see that from time to time. They'll put that up. Well, Dean, how are you today? I'm good. Uh, you look a little tired. Are you on a special diet, or what, what do you? Oh, well, well I, I did start something this morning, so we'll see what happens with it. <laughs> okay, you started. That's good, but it, it's not in the start; it's in the finish. But anyhow, let's not talk about that. I Tyna. maybe should start. <laughs> How are you doing, Tina? <laughs> I am doing good, but maybe I should start something, uh, you know, too. Yeah, well, we Christmas all Christmas is coming, and everything. We all doing so. that, and of course, being the lockdown, people people tend to eat more. So let's yeah. not talk about that right now, because <laughs> I can just look at myself. Um, yesterday on the program. We had a clip where you, Dean, were interviewing Jacob, and he talked about how he became acquainted with our ministry, and then his parents, I guess, followed my teaching, and they listened to me back when we had cassettes. He said, I've made mm -hmm. me feel very old. And, but there was a little clip because Jacob now has, uh, is also doing campaigns, as you are, within the auspices of World Impact Ministries, and we want to raise a many, many, many more people. That's why we have the Global Gospel Institute and all that. And so I'm always inspired when Tina and I see our sons in the gospel or daughters in the gospel, as we also have, out there preaching. And so let's look at that little clip that we didn't see yesterday of the interview that you just did with Jacob. Here we go. So you started putting festivals together and uh, really kind of jumping in first time just with, with very little preparation. And, and now, over the course of the past year, you started holding your very own festivals with World Impact Ministries and uh, in, in both Asia and in Africa, you've held the World Impact Ministries Festival. So can you give our viewers, you know, some of the impressions that you've had uh, during those campaigns that you've uh, led for World Impact Ministries? Well, uh, of course, it was uh, my first campaign for World Impact Ministries. I was very nervous because uh, um, I really was just stuck in this thought that I have to perform something, you know, and do everything right for God to do something on the field which is totally false. Um, so, of course, when you have thousands of people come out to you and, and you're the one that's supposed to share something and, and pray for the sick, you're, you're nervous, right? And, um, but it's just, it's, um, you just have to learn to trust in God. And here's the key, really, to trust in God that he can do something great without your help. He really don't need you, you know, and uh, just to see that God is doing something. God is, uh, uh, you know, that the blind will see again, the deaf will hear again, and uh, all the miracles and healings and, uh, and all of that because of who Jesus is, not because of who, who I am, but because God is faithful. And uh, to see God confirm his gospel with miracles and, and uh, just thousands receive Christ is amazing. Wow, that, that's incredible. And I, I love what you said there. You said that, you know, that it's about God doing it and really it's just about us taking a step of faith and and Jacob you started to do that and is there any uh, you know we have just a couple couple more maybe 30 seconds or anything you would want to say to any of the uh, the partners that are or friends that are watching right now well I of course we want to thank our partners it wouldn't be possible without them I I, I talked to our partners a lot on the phone uh, pray with them and just it's amazing to see all the testimonies uh, and hear all the praise reports from our partners. Uh, they, they are there experiencing Christ with us. You know, I'm thinking, I'm watching that, what I shared yesterday, that God qualifies the willing. And Tina, you will remember, we were going to um, uh, Myanmar, Buddhist country, mm -hmm. and we had someone who was going to go there to do all the work. And then I knew about this young man, Jacob, and he'd wanted to come and work with us, but he wasn't that anxious for us yeah. to have it happen. And then this person says, I can't go. And yeah. then, then I said, well, who have we got? And then we brought yep. Jacob to our house. You remember he stayed with us oh, for yes. three, four days. And I tried to teach him everything in a crash course. And I basically said, Jacob, sink or swim, you know, and he <laughs> yeah. swam. That's all I can say. Yeah. And, and you were there that campaign yep. too, Dean, right? Yeah, that was so, the first one that I joined you. Yeah, on. he was so nervous, you know, but God <laughs> helped him. And so he kind of illustrate the point that God qualifies the willing. Yeah. 
Exactly. I, I just didn't know if you remember that, oh, how we I stayed do. in our home. Yeah. And it comes back to me now when you say that, yes. And even my own heart was beating a little extra, saying, well, is he going to do it? As I'll call you oh, when you get was. there, we'll talk. And he was, but, you know, he just worked, <laughs> found his way among those Buddhists, and, and, mm. and we're just uh, sharing the gospel. You know, it gives me tremendous joy. That, that we are a part of a movement here, a gospel advancement movement, sharing the gospel, bringing it to people. And, and, and I'm introducing my new book, Great Wealth Transfer. And uh, it may sound like a, your typical prosperity preacher message, but I tell you, I'm not your typical prosperity preacher. You can see what I say here. Uh, it's on that side behind me. Um, everything is mirrored, you know, when, when I'm looking at it from this way. People are more precious than things. I'm going to lean this way. I want to get that message across. People, that's the real wealth. People are the wealth. But, of course, God is not an irresponsible dreamer that just tells us to go and reach the world and then doesn't finance it. This is going to help you in a very, I'm talking about something big, global, but it's going to help you. We're looking at one example. And, and this book, by the way, you can see here, if you look at it closely, it says, you can see it there, ancient prophecy predicts. And I'm really, the book is centered around a prophecy 2,500 year old, but I touch on a number of areas. Let's look for a moment at, at the great wealth transfer that David, the great king of Israel, experienced. We think of him as a mighty warrior, the inspired psalmist, and a great leader. Yet, you know, David had an insignificant and rather unassuming childhood. First Samuel chapter 16 describes how Samuel the prophet arrived at David's home in Bethlehem for the express purpose of finding the next king of Israel. Jesse, who was David's father, introduced all of his sons to the prophet, but did not include the younger son, David, in the lineup. That gives us a clue that David's own father didn't expect too much from him. After the inspection of the sons, we read, Samuel, that's the prophet, said to Jesse, are these all your children? And he said, well, there's one more of the youngest, and he's tending the sheep. Uh, you know, uh, the biblical record here is that God works with unlikely people. And it seems that David, as a young man, even from his own father's perspective, was unlikely. So let's see what happened. Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance. He was a good-looking young boy and goodly to look to. And the Lord said to, to, to Samuel, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, now, he had been keeping the sheep. You know, that was kind of a lowly task, often carried out by servants. So we can understand that they didn't have the servants to do it. So the family of Jesse, maybe today we would say it, kind of part of the middle class. David was clearly an ordinary young man trying to help out on the family farm. And yet this unassuming shepherd boy was to become what we today would call a multi-billionaire. God was to do a transfer of wealth. I'm incredible. And he wasn't going to keep all that money for himself like some dictatorial king, but the people were to share in that wealth. Uh, you could say that during David's reign, it's quite phenomenal. Israel, a previously poor, agrarian, subservient nation, experienced phenomenal and unprecedented increase in wealth. By the end of his life, David was able to donate the equivalent of several billion U.S. dollars. I mean, that's a fantastic sum of money in, in one lifetime that he accumulated. I mean, in, in, in one generation, an extraordinary transfer of wealth had occurred in Israel. And, and that's very important. What was the purpose of all that? Well, without the transfer of that wealth during David's reign, his son Solomon would not have had the resources to build the majestic extravagant temple. Once again, we see the key point here that I want, I want you to see this. It sounds kind of not that important when you say it at first, but, but think about it deeply. God provides the necessary re resources to build his dwelling place. If God wants something built, he pays for it. And remember, today, we are not looking at brick and mortar. Today, we are looking at, at, at the temple of living stones, 8 billion people. You, you know what David experienced? You know, we talk about GDP today, gross domestic product. And then if it's 3%, that's really good. Anything above that is great. We have no idea what the GDP was in Israel, but it must have been, been really great. I mean, David saw, uh, David saw tremendous transfer. From, from a downtrodden nation to something great. Why did God bless David abundantly? That's a good question. One, 
I would say God's favor was on David. We often hear about David, the psalmist spoken of in such glowing terms. But, you know, if David attended the same church, maybe where you or I are members, some would probably consider him unfit to be a deacon, a board member, or a worship leader, even though he wrote psalms. Yet in spite of what many would consider his irreparable moral failures, David was called a man after God's own heart. How are we to understand this? To be clear, I'm not suggesting that we are to follow in the footsteps of David's sins and failures. Of course not. But I say it anyhow. Of course not. The Bible teaches that the way of the transgressor is hard, and David suffered much grief and humiliation because of his sins. We don't follow David's sins, but we follow his example of faith and love for God. So that's one reason. Secondly, God had a specific plan for the wealth that was generated for Israel. It was to finance the construction of the temple, God's dwelling place. And the amount of money that was donated is staggering. Let, let me read. Now, with all my ability, I have provided for the house of my God gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver and bronze for the things of bronze and iron for the things of iron and wood for the things of wood and onyx stones and inlaid stones and stones of antimony and stones of various colors and all kinds of precious stones and alabaster in abundance. Notice I underline two things there. All my ability. It's also translated, all my, all my might. Something powerful happens when we pursue something with all of our might. You know, this is a phrase used often about David. And maybe that's why another reason why he's called a man after God's own heart. When he danced before the Lord, he danced with all his might. When he prepared his financial resources for God, he did it not half-heartedly. He did it passionately with all the imagination and energy he, he had. So I say, whatever you do, do it with all your might. Don't, don't do it half-hearted. It's so boring. It's a recipe for failure. Do it with all your might. That's, I, I think uh, that's the way we've been running things. That's the way we want to reach the world. That's the way we reach out to Muslims and Buddhists. And I tell you, do it with all your might. I'm getting myself fired up here. Notice also in that verse I read, there was another expression, in abundance. Again, nothing poor. Nothing stingy, onyx, inlaid stones, all manner of precious stones, and on and on. And it goes, the temple was to be the very best. Now, David explained his attitude and the reason for his generosity. He said, moreover, in my delight in the house of my God, the treasure I have of gold and silver, I give to the house of my God over and above all that I've already provided for the holy temple, namely 300 talents of gold. And you're going to find out what that is in a moment. And, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the buildings and gold and silver and things of silver. And it goes on and on. Here's the key. Whatever we delight in, is the area where we succeed. If, if you're not delighting in it, you probably will not have much uh, success in it. And another translation says, I have set my affection. To, to, to set our affection is to be passionate, energetic, and focused. It also indicates that we have the power over our affection. We have the power to set our affection. Now, the enormity of King David's donations from his personal finance is, is almost beyond comprehension. I mean, it... it you may want to just tune out and say, this is beyond me, but, but stay with me. It's in the Bible, and it's so detailedly described, it must be important. So according to the most conservative estimates, one Hebrew talent equals 30.2 kilograms. That's about 67 pounds. Now, gold is traded in ounces, and one talent of 30.2 kilos is 1,065 ounces of gold per talent. And you know, the current value of gold is about 1,900 U.S. dollars per ounce. And that means that one talent would be worth more than $2 million. And David gave from his own personal resources 3,000 talents. Do the math. It's staggering. David gave a personal donation of approximately $6 billion in gold alone. Wow. That's why I said you may want to tune out, but please don't do this. Uh, don't do that. The Bible records this. It, now, if we, we don't even calculate the value of the silver and the bronze and the rubies and the diamonds and the marble and the alabaster, it would amount to additional billions in U.S. dollars. I think the point has been made. David had become a person of great wealth. He had experienced a transfer of wealth. 
He was no longer the unassuming shepherd boy from whom, um, you know, nobody expected much. <laughs> no, uh, he, he had experienced Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let me read some more. Then the rulers of the father's households and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and with the overseers over the king's word, they offered willingly. And for the service of the house of God, they gave 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold. Derricks was a certain co coin that was used in those days. And 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze and 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever possessed precious stones gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord. You know, this, this is so staggering. And you may think, well, I mean, I, I, you may say, I'll skip those verses in the Bible. Well, in today's value, if we just look at the gold, forget the iron and forget the rubies and all that, using what I told you the value of it is and the weight, it, 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 it means the donations from the leaders was more than 10 billion in gold alone. I mean, that's staggering for a bunch of poor people an agrarian little nation of Israel, the combined offering of David and his key leaders in today's money exceeded $16 billion in gold alone. Well, evidently David hadn't kept all the money for himself. There was a distribution of wealth that had lifted all of Israel. And you know, uh, today, money had changed hands in those days. It changed hands. Money that wasn't with Israel came. There was a great wealth transfer. Now, the greatest wealth, remember, people are, I'm going to look at this way so I can see it here, people are more precious than things. But God was concerned about his dwelling place. And today's dwelling place is a temple of living stones. You know, we've seen money change hand in 2020. You know, in 2019, the U.S. stock market grew by $17 trillion. Think about that. That's, I can't even fathom that. And, and, and you know what? Uh, so we saw a lot of money gain. Then it was all lost. We witness how quickly money can be gained and lost more than any other generation. We've seen it in our generation because by March this year, much of the enormous wealth, uh, you, you know, was gone. And so there's a lot of wealth in today's society. Much of it's in the hands of unbelievers who are not interested in the gospel. And, and some wealth is in the hands of, of Christians who, who, who are just adherents to the Christian religion, but they don't have the world and souls on their radar screen. But there still is a vast amount of wealth in the hands of believers. If those who call themselves born again, spiritual Christians would see that God prospers believers because he wants the best for them and, and, and he wants the world to be evangelized, then the effects would be huge. I say we could reach the world several times over. And, and, and so God's purpose today is what it's always been. God wants a dwelling place. You know, he had the tabernacle of, of Moses and the temple that Solomon built. It was for God's presence to dwell there. Today, we, and that includes this ministry, our focus, we have a building, but that's not our focus, not the physical structure. Our focus is the temple of living stones, God's eternal dwelling place. And, 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 and so and when we talk about this, we're talking about building God's eternal dwelling place. And this is, you know, I say like this, if God was very particular about, uh, wasn't that striking when I read those? I almost thought those verses would never end about all those precious mm -hmm. stones, gold and silver and onyx and glittering stones. And you can imagine the kind of precious stones, rubies and diamonds or whatever they were, uh, uh, tanzanite stones, I don't know yeah. what kind of stone. Uh, uh, you know, all that was very particular. Well, if God was that particular at that time with a temporary dwelling place, the, the Temple of Solomon, today we are building God's eternal dwelling place, a temple of, of, of living stones, people from every tribe, every nation coming into the kingdom of God. Oh, if, we, if they could expect a great wealth transfer back then, how much more today? Watch this video. An ancient prophecy foretells an unprecedented global event. In his book, Great Wealth Transfer, Dr. Peter Youngren unveils the hidden gems of this prophecy. There are two kinds of wealth, people and finances. By far the greatest is people. People are always more valuable than things. Jesus said that even one person is worth the wealth of the universe. And this wealth, people, 
will experience an unprecedented transfer from spiritual darkness to the light of Jesus Christ. There is also a lesser wealth, finances. The ancient prophecy speaks of the wealth of all nations reassigned for God's purpose. Discover the profound meaning of this 2,500 years old prophecy. Glean life-changing principles from three wealth transfers. Two are past and one is now. Learn nine powerful benefits of the gospel. Learn how first century believers handled finances, what it means today. Study the correlation between a global spiritual awakening and God's abundance. Discover the power of the alignment between God's purposes and yours. For a limited time, this one-of-a-kind hardcover book, normally $22 plus shipping and handling, is available for shipping and handling of $7 only. Order now at peteryoungren.org slash book offer or call 416-745-1820. Well, go ahead and, and, and order that. You see the information on the screen. One of the key words that the announcer is using there is the word alignment. And I don't say this braggadociously, I'm not trying to boast on myself, but I really don't ask God to give us money for the ministry. I don't ask God to give, to, to give money or for, we need money for our ministry. What I seek after is that our ministry called World Impact Ministries is in alignment with God's purpose. So I don't mean that we, we have an abundance of money. We have many times where we are just scraping the bottom of the barrel and we have had seen God do miracles and that's why I need help from you. But I'm saying to you, and I hope you understand the spirit in which I say this, that I don't get on my knees saying, God, give us money. I say, God, help us. What is it you want us to do? How can we be in alignment with your purpose? Because I'm a firm believer. If, if we, and I think this ministry, what we're doing for the world, I don't know anybody else who's doing as much really in these unreached religious group, Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims. If we are in alignment with God's heart, then God will speak to people to say, this is worthy of my involvement. This is worthy of my involvement. And, and so I, I hope you take that in the spirit. And I think it should be true for everyone that sometimes you're saying, God, give me this, God, give me this. Find out what is God doing. Somebody told me what God is doing. Somebody told me a long time ago, uh, you know, don't ask God to support what you're doing. Find out what God is doing and support that. And that will trigger that, that all of heaven is in favor of, of that alignment. So I hope you'll get a hold of this, order it for your friends and then so on and so forth. And, uh, get it ready to use it as a gift. And any thoughts come to mind, Tyne? I, I'm, I'm getting, I, I feel this strongly. I'm getting stirred up, so, so, so talk to me. Well, you have given such great uh, illustrations and teaching about this now. But I would say, I would sort of emphasize that purpose. Think about the purpose of what is behind what we are doing, what you are doing. And, uh, and God gives and people give that purpose for your giving. And it just keeps adding up. You can't help it, but when you give to God's kingdom, you know, you cannot, I know that it is kind of, uh, so many people say, have said that, but you cannot outgive God. But it is just, it's like yeah, right. feeding itself. The more you give, the more you are able to give, the more you see those precious stones in God's kingdom. People, they are the precious yeah, yeah. stones now, today. And I've always held to that. You know, that people say, oh, I don't believe in prosperity. I said, I don't either, except I believe in prosperity for a purpose. Yes. You know, when people lose purpose, I, I read a study they did with the prisoners, and some was it in our country. I don't think they could do that. But they wanted to break them mentally. And so what they did was they, they had a huge pile of bricks and rocks in one part of the prison yard. And they told the prisoners, we want you to by hand carry them all over to the other side. And then when they had accomplished that, they said, now we want you to carry them back where they first were. Mm -hmm. And so forth and so forth to bring a sense of purposelessness. Right. And it mentally broke them. And I, I tell you, in this time where there's so many things that we were accustomed mm -hmm. to that were the normal that we don't have, it's more than important than ever to have be, be, be on purpose, yes. to be people on purpose. And, and so 
That is the spirit of this book, and you will catch it. I will dare say you haven't read another book like that on wealth transfer. I share many financial ideas. I talk about quantitative easing, and I talk about different things in there, what that is. But, but really, it's about the purpose. And so um, align yourself with that in the name of Jesus. I'm, I'm getting stirred up here now, but, but get a hold of that. Dean, what, what thought came to you there when I was uh, giving that teaching? You know, the whole time you're just talking about how God provided uh, David and the Israelites for what he, what he was doing, uh, you know, with, with their dwelling place. And he, it's so true. He's doing the same thing today. And I, I would love to just say to the partners, you know, the, the people that he's bringing in this uh, Temple of Living Stones, I just think about the, the Buddhist monks that have never heard of Jesus that mm. did come to know him. Mm. And then I think of the Muslim uh, Shekis there in, in East Africa and in Indonesia. And so many beautiful, precious people coming together as that Temple of Living Stones that God truly is providing for his dwelling place. Yeah, and, and you know, to me, what struck me, I was meditating on King David because we talked about the great transfer of wealth in his lifetime that when he started out, the whole story that he was kind of an unassuming guy. I keep calling him the unassuming shepherd boy. You wouldn't have, even his own dad didn't expect much. He didn't even bring him in the lineup of potentials to be crowned king. And, and so God uses unlikely people. I mean, it, it quickly, quickly. You see what's happening even during this lockdown. We, we, we had a new record for this week here. Look at our Hindi campaign. 18 million plus have been reached. And, and, and for those who participated in the whole campaign, it's now well over 800,000. This is, a, I mean, anytime you have a gospel meeting with 831,000 people in the meeting, it, it, that's what we've been doing during yeah. this lockdown. And the Swahili campaign, which is a much smaller language, look at that. Look at that. The numbers are going up. 3.6 million plus reached. That means that they participated or saw something of the service, but 275,000 plus attended the entire campaign. I mean, you help make this happen. So thank you. Order the book and get it for your friends. Get it for yourself. Be inspired. And then, you know, God is for you. You say, well, I have a problem. I need healing. Well, in the name of Jesus, the same power of God that helps us to touch nations is touching you in the name of Jesus. Write to me. Text me. And let me know what God is doing for you, how we can pray for you, how we can include you in our prayer request. And then rejoice that God is so good to you. God loves you. You are truly a loved person. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A 2W1, or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.